Welcome back to another episode of Swamp Stories. For this episode, we dive into a motorcycle rivalry that's taken over the West Coast. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. You can also follow the Instagram page as well. So let's get into it. We began in the early to mid 1960s, a strange time in American history. All over the country, young men were returning home from Vietnam. So many of them were traumatized and struggling with readjusting to American civilian life. So to get their mind off things, many veterans joined motorcycle clubs. The Hells Angels were by far the most prevalent and fastest growing in the early 1960s. They formed chapters in San Francisco, Oakland, Los Angeles, and even Las Vegas. Joining the Angels gave veterans a sense of brotherhood and freedom. They rode all around the west coast with their friends and sometimes they got a little rough. Well, obviously the Hells Angels were the big bad wolf that everyone wanted to join. However, some people wanted to create their own club, particularly in the city of San Bernardino. In 1965, a group of 13 friends joined together on the corner of 8th and Davidson. This is where a man named Rudy Esparza pitched his idea of starting his own motorcycle club. His vision was for them to be the club that nobody messed with. At the time, everyone was afraid of the Hells Angels, especially in Southern California. Well, these 13 men wanted to replace them as the most feared in the state. They called themselves the Vagos, meaning vagabond in Spanish. This described their desired nature, guys who would wander around and travel everywhere they want. And after choosing the name, Rudy chose green as their main color to represent their Mexican heritage. Well, in the following years, Vago membership grew to 100 members, and with this, they grew a bad reputation as well. By 1970, dozens of members had gone to prison for various reasons. The Vagos were moving around doing whatever they wanted. After a few years of expansion, the Vagos became serious competitors to the Hells Angels. In fact, their reputation may have been worse, especially after this next incident. And that takes us to May of 1974. Here we are in blazing hot Albuquerque, New Mexico, and the Vagos roll through town. The Vagos are on their way to California and just so happen to stop in Albuquerque for some drinks and a good night's sleep. The five tatted up men on their loud motorcycles arrive at a motel on Route 66. It's just an ordinary Friday night and the bikers take a stroll to a bar across from the University of New Mexico. There they have a few drinks and head back to the motel. They head out of town by 11 a.m. hoping to reach Phoenix by sunset. Well, fast forward another day and the bikers arrive in Los Angeles and meet up with some friends. When they meet up, the five members are faced with the worst news of their lives. They're on the front of every newspaper out, the FBI's most wanted men. The members are as confused as ever, but figure that they have to turn themselves in. After being extradited to New Mexico, the entire state is looking at them in disgust. That's because they're being accused of claiming the life of a UNM student named William Velton. There was absolutely no evidence. All they knew was that these loud men rolled through town the same night that William went missing. So to gain information, the police put each member in the cell with an undercover informant. Four of the informants claimed they got no information, but one claimed he did. At the time, they didn't use recording devices, so they had to trust his word. And just off this one statement, the five men were sentenced to death row. This was the mainstream world's introduction to the Vagos Motorcycle Club. And the worst part about it is that they had nothing to do with the situation. In January of 1976, the informant finally admitted that he lied. And on top of this, there was another man who felt guilty as well. That would be Rodney Lee, the man who was actually responsible. He felt so guilty about what he did that he ended up turning himself in. And after 36 long months, the five Vagos were finally released. For three years, the men suffered and had the entire world hating the Vagos. Despite the bad publicity, the Vagos kept growing to hundreds and hundreds of members. They were no longer exclusive to Mexican Americans and more importantly, they were making a ton of money. While traveling across the country, they would pack up their motorcycles with all kinds of substances. Interestingly enough, no one expected this, so for years the Vagos went without legal trouble. However, this lucky run would come to a major crash starting in 2001. Get ready because this is crazy. Let me introduce you to a man named Charles Falco. Charles was a lifelong criminal, one who specialized in Walter White activities. Well, in 2001, Charles' Los Angeles home was raided. That was it. All of his millions were confiscated and he was facing life in prison. 
But Charles was not the blockbuster arrest that the DEA and ATF wanted. Instead, they wanted to take down major organizations like the Hells Angels or the Vagos. So they offered Charles Falco an alternative plan. They offered him a chance to have his case dismissed if he became an informant. But this was no easy task, let me explain. The ATF had their eyes set on the Vagos for years, but could never get any members to give up information. This is because the Vagos keep their information in-house and extremely classified. So to get real information, the ATF wanted Charles Falco to infiltrate the Vagos Motorcycle Club. Charles agreed without hesitation, and he went all in. He had three years to get what he needed, and if not, he had to serve life in prison. So here's how it went. Charles was sent to Victorville, California. Located 40 minutes north of San Bernardino, Victorville is another wasteland. Poverty, unemployment, and just overall depression in the desert. Like when Charles got there, I'm pretty sure he thought, damn, I probably should have just went to prison. Well, Victorville is a stronghold for the Vagos, specifically a bar on D Street. So this is where the ATF sent Charles on his mission. On a fall day of 2001, Charles makes his way into the intimidating bar. He sits down with a couple of members and tells them a story. He tells them that when he was in prison, a Vago member always had his back. This of course was a complete lie, but the Vagos loved it. And after more conversations, the relationship took off. By 2002, Charles Falco officially became a member of the Vagos. This was the Victorville chapter, and coincidentally, the same phenomenon was taking place about an hour south. But this time, it was for a different reason. Let me introduce you to a man named George Rowe. George is a tough blue collar man from the city of Hemet. This is another blazing hot poor town in the Inland Empire. Well, in the summer of 2003, George's best friend allegedly lost his life at the hands of the Vagos. It started with an argument and scuffle at a local pool hall. There, George's best friend got into it with some Vago members. And strangely, he ended up missing a couple days later. George Rowe was devastated by the loss of his best friend, and he definitely wanted revenge. However, George was not going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a large organization like the Vagos. Instead, he contacted the FBI volunteering to infiltrate the Vagos. So they gave him the same plan as they gave Charles Falco. George Rowe also became an official member of the Vagos. In fact, by 2006, both men had become the second highest rank within their chapters. All of this while wearing wires as federal informants. Charles Falco was just trying to get out of a prison sentence, that's all he could focus on. On the other hand, it's alleged that George Rowe kind of fell in love with the life of a Vago. He became a true star within the organization, to the point where meetings were held at his house. On top of this, it also brought him a future wife, who happened to love bad boy bikers. The whole time, she had no idea that her fiancé was an informant. However, that would change on the morning of March 9th, 2006, 6 a.m. George wakes his wife up early and tells her that he has something to confess. He tells her that he's been an FBI informant for three years, and that today 700 members will swarm Southern California and arrest all of the Vagos. He then gives her an ultimatum. He informs her that he has to enter witness protection and move to a different state. Will you come with me or not? I guess we'll never know. Charles Falco underwent the same procedure as well. That night, 62 Vago members were taken down. This was known as Operation 22 Green, one of the most successful takedowns in California history. This was a major blow, something the biker world had never seen before. It actually changed the landscape of motorcycle clubs forever. From here on, membership became extremely hard to obtain. Biker clubs across America could no longer trust who they were letting in, especially for the Vagos. They never wanted to experience this again. Well, the next few years were pretty quiet, especially because so many members members were now facing life. The FBI figured that they won the battle and the Vagos would not return. Boy, were they wrong. The Vagos would come back worse than ever before with an arc of vengeance. They wanted to take over the state of California, claiming the title from the Hells Angels. And here is what you came here for. For years, the Vagos and Hells Angels did not get along, but it never got that serious. They didn't speak and stayed in their own lanes. But that would all change on January 27, 2010. Santa Cruz, California. 
The coastal beach town is beautiful and attracts thousands of tourists, but it also has a darker side. The region is located an hour south of the Bay Area along the Pacific Coast. Of course, the coast is expensive and home to many multi-millionaires, but the inland parts are resemblant to California's Central Valley. Gang territory and turf battles have existed in Santa Cruz, Watsonville, and especially Salinas. For the most part, it's been the Northsiders and Southsiders, but that's its own lane. For the biker world, this has has always been Hell's Angels territory, without a doubt. Well, on January 27th in Northern California, Vago's chapter decides to head down to Santa Cruz. They take a long ride from Yuba City to downtown Santa Cruz. Two members lead in their motorcycle while their leader follows behind in a white van. For hours, they circle around Santa Cruz looking for Hell's Angels. Finally, they locate two angels outside of a Starbucks. This is the perfect opportunity, so the Vagos pull over to instigate. The angels members are furious, so they get on their bikes and chase the Vagos down Front Street. Then, Vagos leader Thomas Froberg swerves his van in the middle of the street to stop traffic. He gets out of his car and single-handedly fights three Hells Angels. Froberg loses the battle, so the other Vagos come to help. This turned out to be an ugly scene, but thankfully everyone was okay. Ultimately, this kicked off a bitter rivalry between the Vagos and Hell's Angels. And the scariest part is that you never knew where or when it could go down. Now we take a trip up Highway 80 from San Jose. First, you pass through the Bay Area and then Sacramento. You reach the town of Auburn and that's when you start climbing the mountains into beautiful Lake Tahoe. Ski resorts, soccer moms, and overall wealth. Then you keep going through the mountains and reach the state of Nevada. From here you decline into the desert until you reach the city of Reno. Ugh. Reno is disgusting, probably one of the ugliest and most depressing cities one can ever travel to. Pawn shops, casinos, the smell of cigarettes, and motorcycle clubs. Just like Victorville or Hemet, Reno constantly has clubs rolling through town. And on September 23rd, 2011, the two rival clubs end up at the same casino. The San Jose Hells Angels and the Vagos of San Francisco are at the Nugget Casino in Sparks, Nevada. Unknowingly, both of the clubs are on opposite sides of the floor, and at 11 p.m. they just so happen to cross paths. An argument and scuffle break out in the middle of the crowded floor. The Angels leader Jeffrey Pettigrew ends up on top of a Vagos member, and that's when a Vagos standing behind him takes it to another level. Ernesto Gonzalez walks up to Jeffrey Pettigrew. The entire incident was caught on camera, resulting in the arrest of Ernesto Gonzalez. Ernesto argued that he was protecting his friend, but the judge was not having it. This is the same predicament as the King Von Lil Tim situation. On one hand, you understand why Ernesto did what he did, but on the other hand, it was unnecessary and could have been resolved in a different manner. Well, as you would expect, the entire Hells Angels community was furious. Pettigrew was a well-liked and respected leader. This could have been kept as a simple scuffle and everyone could have gone home. Well, not only did this make them hate the Vagos, it also caused an internal tear. Within the organization, some members were upset that others would allow this to happen to their leader, and the tensions would boil up just three weeks later. October 15th, 2011. Jeffrey's funeral is held at San Jose's Oak Hill Cemetery. There, over two dozen police officers are present to keep the peace. The city of San Jose is fearful that the Vagos might roll through, especially given that there are hundreds of Angels members present. In total, 4,000 people are in attendance. That's how popular Jeffrey was. Well, instead of the Vagos causing problems, the issues come from within. After the service, two fellow angels get into a loud argument. That would be Steve Ruiz of Stockton and Steve Towson of San Jose. Hey, Somehow things go left and Ruiz <laughs> takes it to another level. So in front of everyone, he makes a terrible decision. <laughs> Steve was another well-respected OG in the Angels community. His nickname was Mr. 187, which should speak for itself. But on a positive note, he was also a former professional boxer and Marine. I mean, I think he was a great guy, and, it, and it's an unfortunate event, and it happened at a Hell's Angels event. A makeshift memorial has been set up outside the bail bonds office of Hell's Angels, Steve Tossin, nicknamed Mr. 187. I'm sad to hear that, uh, Things occurred in open daylight and that it was uh, within his own brotherhood. That's an upsetting event. Uh, it's always seemed to be a good group of people. I would have never imagined any event like that would have occurred. 
at a special at a funeral. Tossin was the sergeant at arms for the Santa Cruz chapter, the Hells Angels, basically a shot caller who makes sure members follow the rules and do what they're told. Well, with two leaders gone within weeks, the Angels knew they had some reevaluations to do. And over the next decade, things were pretty quiet between the groups, especially because the Angels had a much bigger and long going battle with the Mongols. However, they never forgot about what happened to their leader, Jeffrey Pettigrew. And that takes us to the summer of 2022. In late May, the Vagos have an annual ride to show appreciation and honor to fallen veterans. They head to the Memorial Cemetery in Boulder City and then head back to California. Well, after showing their respects to the veterans, they head down US 95 South. This is a remote highway that has no stops for 41 straight miles of desert. It's the type of freeway where you cruise along and look at the mountains in the distance. The Vagos do exactly that until they notice three Hells Angels linked lingering behind them. The angels get on their bumper and start swerving between the Vagos. So the Vagos speed ahead, and that's when the angels make a terrible decision. Richard Devries, Russell Smith, and Stephen Allo all grab their blowers. <laughs> Thankfully, all of the Vagos made it, but it was an ugly scene. The news spread all over the West Coast, prompting some witnesses to speak up. Because of this, the three Angels members were arrested and are now facing 25 to life. The timing of this incident was disgraceful, never on a day of honor and remembrance. On top of this, the incident sparked up the rivalry that many thought they had left in the past. As much as I love motorcycle clubs, incidents like this give the whole culture a bad rap. Well, that's gonna do it for this episode of Swamp Stories. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. Peace!